welcome to Book Lust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guests today at University Bookstore are Rosemarie and Vince Keenan, who together write as Renee Patrick. Vince and Rosemarie, thank you so much for coming by. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure. I'm a big mystery fan. I love talking to mystery writers, and I'd love to know where the idea for this series began. And mm -hmm. while you're telling that, maybe talk a little bit um, about the series itself. Absolutely. Okay. Full credit for this idea belongs to Rosemary. So I will <laughs> take that full credit because it was <laughs> my idea. With it. Yeah. Um, so Vince is the managing editor of Noir City, which is the magazine for the Film Noir Foundation. And I decided I wanted to write an article for them about costume design and film noir. Because some of us who go to those film noir festivals were there, maybe not mostly, but very much for the clothes, you know, the vintage clothing and the design. Um, and so I started researching costume design and found Edith Head and started reading about her life and just something about her career which was 40 years at least long in Hollywood, um, made me say to Vince one day, you know what? What if Edith Head solved mysteries? It just kind of came to me. And then he said, I like to think I can recognize a good idea when I hear one. <laughs> and I thought it was a fantastic avenue into exploring the history of Hollywood. Uh, costumes as a way of, of bringing any kind of characters that we wanted onto the page actors and directors and getting a sense of how movies were made, especially during the golden age of Hollywood when Edith started out her career. And so I said, if you don't do this idea, I'm going to do this idea. So maybe we should try doing it together. I was I liked the idea so much I was convinced that if we didn't do it, somebody else was going to. Uh -huh. And that's always a great impetus where you think, yeah, this this idea is too good, someone right. will take it. Right. And we have to do it now. <laughs> no. Let's just get going. Yeah. Well, so so you began with the idea that Edith Head would be the the detective, or in her, but, the, but then where did Lillian Frost, who is, um, I think, is going to be everybody's favorite, in, in in these books? Don't you think she's so she's such an interesting young well, woman? We like her. We yeah. love Lillian. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, well, when we started kind of talking it out and thinking about a plot and learning even more about Edith Head. It's like, she worked like a mule. She was at the studio every day, six days a week. You 12 know, tw hours a 12 day. 12 hours a day. And we thought, well, she can't be running out to the Trocadero to be chasing down clues. She needs some assistance. Um, and we and, were both, yeah. we both grew up huge fans of Rex Stout. Uh -huh. And we thought, well, an idea that works mm -hmm. for Rex Stout could work maybe for us. And so we, we, we openly admit we patterned the whole thing on Nero Wolf because we're such fans of, of, of those books. And Nero's the classic armchair detective, and we thought, well, by virtue of her job, Edith is also an armchair detective. What she needs mm -hmm. is a funny leg man, or in this case, leg woman, and mm -hmm. that's Lillian. Right, and so yeah. Lillian can run around town and find clues, and yep. yeah. And well, we love the idea of, of Lillian as a character who, like so many other women of, the, of that period, went out to Hollywood to, 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 to make their name. That was really common then, the whole notion mm -hmm. of the screen tests. Right. Oh, right. you win a contest and yeah. you get sent to Hollywood and right. then you see if you can become the next, you know, Norma Shearer or somebody. Right. Yeah. At, and so in the first book, Design for Dying, that's when we learn a little bit about Lillian's backstory and how she came to Hollywood and um, lived in a rooming house with other young women who also had designs on uh, making it in Hollywood. Making it, yeah. becoming yes. famous. Not at all influenced by stage door, by the way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And so, and I was going to say, like Nero Wolfe, and those novels are told by Archie Goodwin, mm -hmm. these are told by Edith Head's leg woman, uh, Lillian Frost. Right, we really yes. wanted to get into Lillian's life and how she saw things. Um, and as, as Vince always says, we're looking at, it's kind of a female-centric view of Hollywood in those days, which I feel like you really don't see that much. Right. So, Edith affords us that opportunity because um, fairly unusually for the time. I mean, she was a high-ranking woman executive at a major studio in the, in, starting in 1938 when she, was, she officially got the job and then stayed at Paramount until 1967 and then ended, ended up at Universal. And so she's, she's a great avenue into exploring uh, what, what it was like for women working in Hollywood at the time. Yeah, I was going to say one of the one of the things that I that I really enjoyed about these books was how much history, how much Hollywood history, 
there is in these books and I, uh, how much actual research did you did you do? I mean, we like to think we've been researching these books all our lives. For your life. Because yeah. we've been this is it's an excuse for us now to watch movies we would have been watching anyway. So, well, now it's work. Oh, it's yeah. this is all research. Yeah, research. Grist Definitely. for the mill. <laughs> right. And right. I've always been a big fan of like showbiz biographies. And so it was just digging a little bit more into that and of uh -huh. course then then we did some pretty intensive kind of on the ground research in Los Angeles. Oh, that must have been really hard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're really a hardship. We're hardship. still not recovered from it. It's so difficult. Right, right, right. <laughs> but I, we started with um, Edith's own papers, which was an absolute revelation. She, will, she left her estate to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, and all of her personal correspondence is at the Margaret Herrick Library in Beverly Hills. And so we have set up camp in that building more than once mm -hmm. and just gone through her entire life, which is, is always a treat for us. I mean, to mm -hmm. go through the papers and, and pick up a letter that she was sent by Alfred Hitchcock, knowing that Hitch yeah. signed it and that she took it out of the envelope and then to just hold that in your hands for a moment, is, is that's always gonna be a thrill for us. It's amazing, there were letters back and forth between her and her husband with pressed flowers in them oh. and just, yeah, so so she did the great. costume design for North by Northwest and those those Hitchcock. She did she did a, a number of of Hitchcock movies. They had a very long collaboration that started in the 40s and went all the way up to um, his last film Family Plot yeah, in 1976. Right. So she did The Birds and Vertigo, Vertigo. Yeah. and To Catch a Thief which arguably I think is maybe Edith's greatest achievement. I know she yeah. she always prized that as the the best work that she did in movies because she loved Grace Kelly. Mm -hmm. Grace Kelly was mm -hmm. extraordinary wearing clothes. Right. I mean, I, right. it, it sounds odd to say that that's a skill, <laughs> right. but it is, and she had it, and yeah. the, the costumes yeah. in that are just yeah. breathtaking. Yeah. So the books are set, the, the first book is 1938, seven. Seven, and then the second book is 1938. Yes. Yeah. And, and um, I mean, so much is happening in Hollywood, right, because the studio, I mean, you had to go into all of those, those issues, right? I mean, to give the background, make it a, make it a background that readers would think, oh, oh, you know, I've learned something from this, <laughs> which is well, there's the whole studio system, right? right? So we kind of had to lay that out for readers right. who might not know that. And then Edith herself was having issues in her career yeah. where her her boss's position was tenuous, and she was worried. Well, if they kick him out. Then what about What's me? Do I go with him? Yeah. It wasn't necessarily true that she was just going to get promoted into his job. So yeah. she had some tension there in her career. We deliberately wanted to pick uh, to start the series at a time when Edith Head wasn't really Edith Head, mm -hmm. the, the this famous figure. Um, she hadn't won any of her Academy Awards yet, uh, and was basically convinced that she was going to be back doing her original job, which was teaching. She started as a teacher and um, sort of lucked into a job at, at Paramount as a, as a start originally as a sketch artist and then worked her way up through the, through the ranks. Um, and we were fascinated by that career arc. That's the thing mm -hmm. about Edith that always amazed us is mm -hmm. that if you look at all of her contemporaries, they all had these fantastic pedigrees where they were designing gowns for Ziegfeld girls and wedding dresses for socialites. And Edith grew up in Searchlight, Nevada her father was a mining engineer and mm -hmm. had no exposure to glamour growing up and then got a job teaching was actually teaching Cecil B. DeMille's kids among among other things and got a job at Paramount because it paid better. Right. She's just it, looking for a kind yeah. of a year-round <laughs> position. Right, right, I was like right. well I can kind of draw so let's see if I can get in there. Yeah. I mean it is funny what career arcs one's, one's life takes yeah. and she had a particularly interesting mm -hmm. one at a time when women were not valued in Hollywood except for their appearance. Right. Oh, absolutely. It's, yeah. it's, that's one of the things about Hollywood history that always is, fascinates us is that in the early days of Hollywood, um, women held all the, uh, they were in every position. They were writers, they were directors, mm -hmm. and around the time that the, the, the golden age started where the studio system really took over the mechanics of movie making, they were marginalized and were pretty much just actresses. And Edith was sort of a yeah. unique mm -hmm. figure at that time. So if somebody wanted to become more familiar with um, the golden age of films and Hollywood, what movie or movies would you suggest that they watch? Like, what do you go back to? So 
I have always been a big fan of like screwball comedies and musicals and things. You know, for all our involvement with the Phil Noir Foundation, I'm always yeah. more kind of, <laughs> I'm, I'm tend towards the lighter side. Um, so something like The Palm Beach Story is one of my favorite films, or um, earlier than that, like 42nd Street, those films that kind of, and they give you kind of the flavor of the studios uh -huh. too, huh. so things like that. And I would have to say a movie that you really introduced me to is The Women. Oh, yeah. Oh, by mm -hmm. Claire Booth Luce. Yes. Yeah. yeah. With that amazing fashion sequence. Because that's, that to me was, you know, talking about, you know, with the learning curves. The learning curve for me was dealing with clothes. I'm not going to mm. lie. Not a strong <laughs> suit before I started this. And yeah. so anything where I have the opportunity to actually really appreciate top-notch costume design, that's, that's always the ones that I like to go back to. And the women, I, mm. I think that's the ideal place to yeah, start. And that's just a hilarious movie, too. <laughs> that's right, yeah. right. So, so talk a little bit about, uh, I mean, the question I always like to ask uh, writers who are writing a series of mysteries is whether when you began, you, you s s knew that it was going to be a series. And if so, how you manipulated, how you managed that first book so as not to hem in your characters, because there's always the the example of uh, you know a, a, a married detective in the first book, and then you know eleven books later they have to kill off the wife because they have nothing nothing to say that they can you know, nothing left to say about their relationship. So, were there issues that you I mean, I'm imagining you guys sitting down at a, like at your kitchen table and, you know, making notes of, I mean, how'd you do all that? And We did talk about that actually a lot to start with before we even started plotting out uh -huh. Design for Dying um, because, and yet we sort of knew that, okay, well, it's going to be a series because Edith's career was so long. Uh -huh. If we start in 1937, it's going to take us a while to get to Hitchcock and we really want to get to Hitchcock, so we wow. have to leave things open. Yeah. And we knew that you know, we can just kind of look at her career and say, well, what was the next film she was working on? I think we got, came into more of a difficulty when we were talking about Lillian. Uh -huh. You know, what right. would her life be like? Right, and because that was wide open for you. Right. Yeah. yeah. And we went back and forth about how we were going to uh, end the book in terms of where Lillian was. And I'm, I'm really happy with where we came down on the ending of Design for Dime because it opened up a lot of opportunities that we immediately took advantage of in the second book. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of that was also drawn from history. I mean, uh -huh. the, 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 the character that she ends up working for, um, she ends up getting a job with, uh, as a social secretary for uh, a millionaire who is obsessed mm -hmm. with the movies. Yeah. That character is also based on a real person. Really? Somebody that, yeah, that, that somebody. Rosemary came across in her research, a man named Atwater Kent, who made a fortune in, mm -hmm. in radio parts and moved to Hollywood partly for his wife's health, but mainly because he wanted to be close to the movies. Mm -hmm. and, and he would he, throw these outrageous parties. And How I, I, great is that? Yeah, yeah right. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of a social secretary. Mm -hmm. that would be, they need to bring that position yeah, back. I know, definitely. They really do. <laughs> but, but then you have to have a social life that <laughs> would make it necessary, <laughs> which, I, which unfortunately or unfortunately, I do not. But did, did you ever have a, a big... Um, like disagreement, was there like a fundamental disagreement mm -hmm. about something or other in the books that, you know, like Vince, you said, no, I think this is what should happen, or did that all mm -hmm. get worked out in the plotting of it, or how do you divide your work? I feel like the things that we disagreed on were jokes and turns of phrase, so kind of the yes. smaller things, uh -huh. but as we were talking through the plots, we did it. It was more like a consensus yes. to kind of figure out what the plot was going to be and the big turns. Because it was an interesting ex experience for us because I'd written, uh, I'd worked as a writer before and you mm. hadn't. Right. And <laughs> I hadn't actually worked this closely with a collaborator before and I said, well, we'll, we'll learn together how we're going mm. to go, go about doing this. And so we were very diligent about plotting everything out in advance so that each of us understood what was going to be happening. In, in, in each chapter and in each scene, we didn't want there to be any confusion. So mm -hmm. anything that we could take from the outline, we were good, we agreed with. But when it came to jokes, we, we, th that's, where, <laughs> that's where the dust ups were. Did so, you think, really, you did think you mean that's that to funny? Be funny? <laughs> <laughs> you both said that at the same moment. That's very And the other, the other thing, and this wasn't so much a disagreement, it's just like an ongoing conversation we have to have with ourselves. 
um, are people actually going to get these references? Because we're mm -hmm. so steeped in, right. in old Hollywood and we want to throw in references that, that other people, like people like us who have Turner Classic movies on right. around the clock, mm -hmm. Uh, that they will appreciate, yeah. but you also want to make it accessible to, to, right. to those who are just kind of being introduced to this world. And sometimes we'll think, wow, that's, that's fairly inside baseball, that joke. I don't know <laughs> if we could leave that one there. Yeah. <laughs> but we did want to sprinkle it with cameos or shove yeah. it full of cameos. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on right, how you look right, at it. Right. Um, so we've got Martha Ray in there. And for people who know she, who she is, I think yeah. that would be funny. But we also tried to describe her enough that if you didn't know her from movies or TV, you would still think that the scene was amusing. Right. It's just such a different era in Hollywood. Like you were talking about mm -hmm. the, the notion of the studio system and the sense that you worked at a studio and you, you went there and basically clocked in like it was, you know, a department yeah, store job. or yeah, an right. office and that there was a little community there and that you saw the same people there and there were little cliques in the, in, in the commissary. Mm -hmm. It was it was just so fascinating to us, and it's not at all the Hollywood that people are familiar with today. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so the chance to kind of travel back in time and, and, and be in that world a little bit was was a treat for us. Yeah, I, I, you can imagine, I could imagine in some ways that that studio system led to a kind of middle school um, mentality where, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, you know, these were the big, the, you know, the most important people, and these were the lesser people, and right. these were the cheerleaders, and these were the, mm -hmm. you know, dope, you know, drug addicts, <laughs> and these were the, <laughs> you know, just in every middle school that I've ever. Well, we always like the story um, from, from Paramount's history that uh, Cecil B. DeMille, who was one of their big directors and, and was there for decades, um, used the throne from one of his movies as his seats <laughs> in the commissary, and then Preston Sturgis, who was a wiseacre and was the, and was also there for years, mm -hmm. uh, had this incredible run of movies in the 40s. And when he had a bigger hit than DeMille, he had the prop department make him a bigger chair <laughs> and, and sat it, yeah. opposite him and just waved across the commissary to him. <laughs> And we found in our research that Edith Head was actually the consummate politician, which is one reason she had such a long career. Yeah. So she really knew how to navigate the power structure there just yeah. to keep, her, keep she her spot. She was very savvy dealing with executives. She knew how to collaborate with directors. And most importantly, she knew how to get the actresses on her side, which, which mm. I think you would agree. That's, that's probably the most difficult thing that you'd have to deal with. Right. Mm -hmm. And so she would solicit their opinion and kind of direct them in the way that she needed them to go, but they felt like they were collaborating right. with her. So, so when, when you outlined the book, did you outline it chapter by chapter? I mean, how, how did you work through that? process. I mean, do you have like a big chart on your wall? And <laughs> we do. So Vince, as he mentioned, has been a writer, you know, yeah. since he was seven years old. And for some bizarre reason, he's able to keep it all in his head. And when we started talking about the plot, he would just kind of have it. And, no, we need to, we went and bought some index cards, like just, yeah. it, even if it's just for me, let's get the index cards and a bulletin board and lay it all out so there's one visual representation. Yeah, so you, that's you, what we did. you wanted to see the entire plot and I'd never done that before and once I did it I thought, this isn't a bad idea yeah, actually, yeah. This, this, this works really well, maybe so, I will do this in the future. We did it chapter by chapter and we did some color coding of like which character is kind of the main character uh -huh. in, the, in the scenes and things. We want to make sure Edith is in it you know, as, as often as possible. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's the the main purpose of the color coding is we've been too long without Edith. We, we got to get her back in there. there. Yeah. <laughs> do you do you read differently? I mean, I'm assuming in addition to being movie fans, you're also readers. Oh, sure. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And mystery readers. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you read differently now that you're that you've written these mm -hmm. books? Does that? Yeah. I that's think. a great yeah. question. Um. I don't know. What I've found is that I want to go back and read mysteries kind of from the golden age uh -huh. rather than newer things. Uh -huh. and I wonder, I've just reread and then there were none. You know, uh -huh. I'm reading like the Nero Wolf books. Yeah, me find too. It enjoyable. And then for the newer things, I would tend to, you know, go for more just fiction uh -huh. and not so much the mysteries that are uh -huh. out right now. But actually, Vince, you're a big modern mystery. Reader. Yes, and since yeah. and since writing the book, I found myself wanting to go back and and look at the books that that influenced me and that set me down the path to be a mystery writer because mm -hmm. I'm trying to get a handle on what was it about those books that spoke to me. I mean, I was always I, I would always go back and reread them uh, and 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 
try to break them down, but now that I've been through the process myself, I want to go back and pull like the five or six books that really mattered to me and say, what was it that I learned from right. them right. That, that, that hasn't really left me? And so what are some of those books? Uh, the two authors that, that I blame for all of this <laughs> are uh, Lawrence Block and Donald Wesley. Uh -huh. Those were the two guys, maybe because they were both New York authors and right. I'm from New York originally and there was just something about the rhythm of those stories that spoke to me. Also, um, they weren't afraid to be funny. Right. Mm -hmm. They're both very, yeah, very yeah. funny authors. Westlake in particular right. has like a whole separate career as a, as, as, as a comic right. author. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've always been drawn to people who, who aren't afraid to weave comedy into their, into their mystery. I once was talking to an editor um, about a mystery that she was working on and it was like the third or fourth in the series. I was very eager to get my hands on it. And I said, so when's his new book coming out? And she said, as soon as he fills in that plot, that, that he, he, she said, there's a hole in the plot as big as, you know, like the Grand Canyon that she, that you he has to fill in. It. You could yeah. drive a truck through it, right. Uh, so, is that how you're, so th since then, I mean, I've been noticing, I mean, I always read critically, but, but since I've, you know, been thinking about writing fiction, I, I start noticing techniques that I wasn't aware of so much as a reader, or I wasn't consciously aware of them. D did that, does that, I mean, do you look at these mysteries now more critically or more appreciatively because you see how they manipulated this particular um, potential difficulty? Absolutely, absolutely. One of the, the best learning experiences I've had in the last couple of years is I went through a stretch where I read a lot of gold medal paperbacks, mm -hmm. which are the you know disposable pulp books from the 1950s, but those are just beautifully machine-tooled engines of plot. Uh -huh. And I, I'm actually one of those people who think that a, a plot is one of the reasons why people enjoy reading books. You actually want to be surprised by what's going to happen, and they do a perfect job of setting things up and paying them off. And I went through a period where I read nothing but those for about six months, and I felt like after going through that period of study, I understood plot in a way that I hadn't before. Uh -huh. So if somebody were interested in, in writing mysteries, I imagine that one of the first pieces of advice that you would give them is to read a lot of mysteries. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. And I, I find, just in terms of Vince talking about plot, that he's the master of, well, if we did this, then it would pay off in four different ways. Where I tend to be more like, oh, we can do this, then we can do that. Like, no, do this, like, tweak it a little bit, and these, all these things could happen. Okay, so I feel like I'm really learning a lot in working with him on plot. And did you bring in more of the, um, because, I, I, because I'm not a big plot person, I'm more a character person, mm. and so the mysteries that I most enjoy are the ones where they have, where the characters are well, pretty well developed, and mm. I, you know, which is why I love the Nero Wolf, because of the quirkiness and the great detective mm -hmm. and you know, stuff like that. In, in the fiction that, that you read, Rosemary, do you, is it character-driven fiction that you particularly? I do. I just finished reading um, Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk. Oh, yes. Have you read that? I have. And just to me, just being inside somebody's head and hearing about their life it is, I, I love that. Yeah. And I love that we, we decided to do Lillian in the first person. Yes. You know, because we can really just have, be right there with her feelings. Right. Yeah. Yes. And Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk is, um, mm -hmm. It's, it covers much of the same yeah. period and the same, um, the same struggle that women had mm -hmm. and success that women had at yeah. that time. When I heard what it was about, I was like, I have to read that. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's a lo that's a lovely that. book, yeah. a lovely book too. So who does the actual writing? I mean, we've talked about like there's plot and there's you know, yeah. you know the c color coding, but like, come on, who's sitting down and saying, this is. You know what? Yeah. <laughs> oh, all right, Nancy. We'll tell you. <laughs> well, actually, it's different for the for the two books. But since Vince had been a writer and I hadn't, I insisted with the first book. I need to write the first draft because I need to know that I can do it. Yeah. Um, you you wanted so I, actually that sense of of accomplishment to say right. I took it from start to finish. Right. Yeah. Which I completely understood. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we it worked, it, it the worked plot. out because yeah. at the time I was uh, working at a video game company, and so I was 
gone several nights a week, and it was it was actually the perfect mm -hmm. setup because you could come home from work and then and freed just, up my time completely. Yeah. Yes, let's so. not forget that you like work full time. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> right. So it was kind of fitting this yeah, in like, evenings and weekends yeah, exactly. and vacations. Right. Um, so I wrote the first draft and showed it to Vince, and I said, "The second draft's going to be even better." <laughs> But, Which I thought was nice. But I was really, oh, I was really nice about it because Anthony I mean, was. it was, it yeah. was, it was a huge accomplishment, and the characters were there. I mean, it's it's Rosemary's idea, it's Rosemary's world. She knew so much about right. the history of this period. She knew who Lillian was. She knew who so many of the other characters mm -hmm. were, and um, what we decided to do was. We had talked through the first draft, and she said, I want to do another draft entirely by myself, uh -huh. which you did. So I did, and then I gave it to Vince, and then he worked through that, and at the end, we felt like we had the Renee Patrick voice. Uh -huh. it, it took the three drafts, but then at, at that point, we realized we kind of synthesized our points of view mm -hmm. and created this other one that was, that was Renee, and um, just let her take over. Yeah. Well, there's a mystery series by a woman named, um, by two women who write as Emma Lathan, yes. and, and they write, cha they take turns writing the chapters. Yeah, a lot of, I feel like a lot of um, co-authors do uh -huh. that, and that has, just hasn't been our experience. When it came to Dangerous to Know, because we had a timeline at that point, right. just over the first book, yeah. nobody was waiting for it, so right. we took our time. Right. Um, but for that book, Vince wrote the first draft, uh -huh. and then we went back and forth. We had to, we had to, we yeah. had to reverse the process, because again, you have a day job, right. And um, it was it, when the book was. We had one year to write the book, and we yeah. said, "Okay, if I start it now, we can we can do it. We can mm -hmm. use the same process, but we each take on the other right, role." The other, yeah. But by then, we already knew what Renee sounded like, yeah. and so. So it just went. Except faster, for the yeah. clothes part, because there were still huge sections of Dangerous to Know where there were paragraphs that said, "Dress goes here," uh -huh. and then I because fill that in. <laughs> I do not want to describe the clothes. That is not my Very field of expertise. Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> well, you guys, it's just been a pleasure talking to you, and thank you again, and good luck with the second book, and I'm already looking forward to the third one. Yeah, thank so, you. Thank you so much. Thanks. <laughs>